All right, everybody. It's great to see you here. This is probably our biggest crowd that we've ever had at the meetup, uh, probably mainly thanks to IBM employees uh, showing up. Thanks for getting the word out. But I'm very pleased to have Mita Vogue here to speak to us about Hyperledger, about blockchain and distributed ledger technology, and all of the work that is going into this space to continue to push the boundaries to make this type of technology even more scalable, even more easier for us uh, to engineer and build applications on top of. So without further ado, Mita. Thank thanks. you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm super excited to be here. I have my colleague and a good friend, Mark, with, with me here. Mark actually runs IBM's uh, interaction with the Linux Foundation around the Hyperledger project. So I'm just doing some of the basic pre-work for Mark to really talk to you about the Hyperledger project. Um, we both work at IBM. I, my background is I am the chief data officer for blockchain technologies. That just means I tend to spend a lot of time dealing with spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> I also work on um, our IBM blockchain as uh, for IBM's uh, blockchain as a service product, you know, defining governance for that. So we've been, Mark and I were part of the team when we just first started out and there were two people on our team who wanted to play around with blockchain and gaming. That's how we started. And today Today we have a very, very large team focused here in the, in the, in the triangle. So um, we are focused on the blockchain aspect, right? We are slightly divorced from the cryptocurrencies right now. We are focusing on the blockchain. So I, my, my slide deck is pretty, walks you through the basics of it. And I hope I can get this to work. It was just working, I was testing oh, it. Oh, okay, I just have to, this is the sweet spot. So what is blockchain? Are you all familiar with blockchain? I'm assuming. Ah, okay. So, um, the latest buzzword in innovation, right? Anywhere you go, you say blockchain, they're like, whoa, I was in India and I was invited to talk to ninth graders. They knew what blockchain was. I didn't know anything when I was in ninth grade, but they all knew what blockchain was and they wanted me to tell them how they could quickly make money mining bitcoins. <laughs> I was like, uh-uh, sorry, you can't do that. <laughs> but they all had plans to be multi-millionaires by the time they reached 12th grade. So that was their goal. So I, I tend not to talk about bitcoin, blockchain, etc. I tend to focus on my favorite drink, coffee. Right, so let's talk about coffee. How well do we know our coffee? Um, how much do you know about your coffee? Kind of, a little bit? I no. Trigger, okay. <laughs> so, the economic influence of coffee, coffee numbers, right? It's the second largest traded co commodity in the world after petroleum. It, the global markets draw, uh, d define the pricing for coffee. Um, it's produced in 70 countries, providing jobs and so, and it's a job source for millions of people, right? 100 million people are at any given time involved with the trade of coffee. Um, coffee farms alone provide employment to 25 million people. 90% of the world's coffee production happens in developing countries and it's worth $100 billion, right? Makes it really large in value. So why do we talk about coffee? Because the one thing we've never thought about is how deep is your coffee supply chain? So yeah. you've got produced and produced. So how, how are those two different on that slide? Yeah, 90% of the world's coffee production mm -hmm. and coffee is produced in around 70 countries. So is that 70, the 70 countries that produce it? 90% of those are in the developing world. Gotcha. That's what that means. So this is what a coffee supply chain looks like, right? Uh, it's, I calculated on average it ends up being, this is 12 deep, ends up being 12 to 16 deep. There are, there's government involved, there are regulators involved, there are middlemen involved. And the reason is because all these people don't trust each other, right? So the idea then became, can we, is there a technology that exists that without centralizing something, we can actually get these people to trust each other and as a result, remove intermediaries from it, right? So, to be in my sweet spot. Again, the world's poorest people are farmers. On average, a cacao bean farmer, make, farmer makes $700 a year. 
and on average and a person in America spends eleven hundred dollars on coffee right so just do the math um, what if we were able to bring transparency to the supply chain so we could make more ethical choices about what we were buying we could track it better we could track food safety better so you know if we just work with that motivation what can we do and you know further define are we really buying coffee that's from zero deforestation area so how what is our social impact by drinking this coffee can we minimize it how about the clothes you're wearing how many of you know anything about the clothes that you're wearing were they ethically made were they made in a factory in bangladesh we don't we don't so is there a system that can bring transparency transparency to all these things right and it's not just it's garment it's diamonds and this is the most interesting uh, use case that i heard of um, i'm a chip designer by from background i still teach chip design courses at nc state i'm an adjunct professor there and <clears throat> we use when we build chips we use gold in them right the final interconnect is, is gold um, cars also when they have chips in them they use gold so there's a car manufacturing company in america they got a large shipment of gold and they were told not to accept it because it was funded by terrorist organization so they had to hire a large team a large team of lawyers a large team of other people who had to go figure out the gold had come from zimbabwe had they had to figure out was it really funded by terrorists what was the connection right so this guy spent months chasing ghosts and then ultimately they figured out that the gold that they got was funded by a terrorist organization out of the hong kong right something very very hard to because it was it wasn't even in the top list of terrorist organizations so now we finally and that's what ma makes me passionate about this technology we finally have a technology that can actually bring more trust in the system and bring more transparency to this right so when i go to buy a piece of jewelry or my clothing or food or my coffee i should be able to tell in the future am i making the right choices is it safe right am i making ethical choices so now why, why does blockchain help us right and sorry my clicker okay the three things that blockchain does for us it reduces settlement time from days to near instantaneously so when you're interacting with five different people and you you create a voucher and they have to settle it now you can almost do it immediately right so it reduces time it removes the overhead and costs of intermediaries you don't need the middleman men, middleman anymore it risks reduces the risk of collusion and tampering right because i've had these three three features i've actually also brought the cost of things down because i've been able to do that so it was this these features and the ability of what blockchain could do for us that really attracted IBM um, to the blockchain technologies. We are all about creating business networks, right? And the way blockchain works, you're all familiar, you could probably educate me on blockchain technologies. We have, we have a shared transactional replicated ledger. Everybody has a copy of it. We all know what's going on in the system. It's we at IBM and at Hyperledger are building a fabric called Hyperledger Fabric, which is a permissioned blockchain. So you, you have permissions, you have governance that defines your business network. So you can say, you know, if there are five people, you can define the rules that you're gonna all play by. And if you don't follow those rules, you can, you know, you can get kicked out. So, um, if we just look at just from the data perspective, being the chief data officer for blockchain technologies, I see more data than I can keep up. We have more interests from companies than we, we can keep up. There is such a huge pull from the market, you know, less of a push. And um, financial, government, healthcare, and supply chain. Are our biggest few right from a, from a hyperledger perspective banks spend 270 billion dollars on regulatory compliance every year right we're working you know a lot of banks are interested in blockchain technologies and they are going to they're actually looking to move into production fairly soon if it's not 2017 it's definitely going to be uh, uh, 2018 um, healthcare sharing data across organizations could save hospitals 93 billion dollars reconciling health records we are working with a federal team <clears throat> that's just working on reconciling um, health benefits 
and that's billions of dollars for them, right, for millions of federal employees. Um, trade is big for us, right? $600 billion in fraud. The amount of trade that happens is in trillions of dollars, has more zeros than I can count. They spend 30 billion, this is surprising to me, they spend th waste $30 billion just shipping empty containers. They can't even tell <laughs> that a container is empty. They can't tell this container has flowers, empty this one first, right? They spend more money sending the paperwork of a container across than actually shipping the container from, from one place to another. So there's a huge scope for improvement there. And with government, 1.5 billion, that's the you know, thing that's, mo that's very close to my heart. 1.5 billion people worldwide do not have a legal identity. That's, you know, people, it's a humanitarian crisis. People not having an identity is a humanitarian crisis. Look at refugees when they have to cross borders and they have no way of having an identity. So we, I mean, that's a big use case. And we are, you know, there's a lot of work being done in this field. Um, I forget. Okay, with that, I will hand it over to Mark so he can actually talk to you about the Hyperledger project and what we're doing with the Hyperledger project. So. Oh boy. All right, can everybody hear me okay? I don't know if this thing's on or not. Um, Great, so I get to follow Mita, who is a professional teacher at NC State uh, and a great presenter to uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, what I don't know what are coming on these slides. So um, <laughs> I, came, I came in today and uh, Mita told me she was doing this, asked if I could uh, join her. I said, yeah, I'd love to watch you. And then, oh, can you do the second half of it? Oh, great, thanks Mita. Um, anyway, uh, so, my job role, I am an offering manager at IBM, so IBM pays my paycheck. However, my main focus is in the open source community, and I spend my time beating IBMers to become open source developers in a real life open source project. And the Hyperledger project, which contains many different projects underneath it, is the main focus that I am looking at at this point. So if you look at Hyperledger, it's an overarching umbrella of open source projects, all based around blockchain technologies or blockchain technology tools. Hyperledger Fabric is the one project under Hyperledger that IBM is most concentrated on. So you have Fabric, you have Sawtooth Lake, which is now just becoming Sawtooth, Aroha, uh, Cello Explorer is, is different tools, um, Composer, which is going to work across all the different blockchain technologies and things. Um, a lot of cool stuff I can talk a little bit more about later. Um, so as the chart here says, in 2015, uh, we became an official project in the open source community. This was big in many ways because we wanted to bring uh, another blockchain technology to the community, but we wanted to do it around permissioned blockchain technology. Um, at that time, there really wasn't much in permissioned blockchains. We felt that there needed to be something out there that we could do to build uh, for enterprise businesses um, that, that you know gave them that feeling and, and warm and comfort of trusted you know partners and things of that nature uh, but we loved the technology so I mean we tried a lot of different things it just it, it didn't pan out for several different reasons um, and so we, we started to homegrown our own code base and within three months we actually had developed our first blockchain put it out to the community, uh, put it forward actually to the Linux Foundation, said this is kind of what we want to do. They said, cool, this is kind of what we want to do too. So immediately we had a, a great partnership. We had been working with groups like Digital Asset Holdings. Um, we had been talking to Intel before they went through uh, Sawtooth and, and several others and created the Hyperledger uh, project. So Hyperledger was donated by Digital Asset Hon uh, Holdings as their, that was their name of their blockchain technology they were working on previous to Hyperledger and they still have some proprietary stuff on their side. Um, so quickly, 
we started gaining a lot of interest, as, as Mita mentioned, from the community and people that were interested in blockchain technologies. And so, as a, as a matter of fact, Mita has some numbers I think she, she may go into later or, or t be able to talk about. But uh, as we're talking to, to Jameson, we, we have over 3,700 active people in our rocket chat. Now, does that mean they're contributing? No. No, we got a lot of lurkers out there. And that's okay, because people are trying to figure out what is blockchain, how do I make money off of it? One of those people is IBM, right? I mean, we're, we're in this to make money, of course. Right now, we're in it to gain adoption. We're trying to get people to get out there, look at what's available. Hyperledger is out there trying to look at what's available to get these projects to work together or come up with something that actually is a great, you know, best of breed type of thing. And we're gaining interest, you know, Ethereum's come to the table, uh, you know, Microsoft's looking at, at it. We're getting, I mean, everybody's there. It's, it's great technology that there's plenty of room for everybody. It just depends on what you want to do. So defining your business case first is the key thing and then determine what do I put underneath it, right? I mean, it all started, whenever you talk, the first slide that, that Mita had, what is, what is blockchain? Every time I have that conversation, my response is, do you know what Bitcoin is? Right? I mean, yes, I know, I know a little bit about it. Okay, that's not it. But Bitcoin is built on blockchain technology, you know, and you go from there. So um, I've kind of rattled on quite a bit about this, this slide. Let me uh, move on and see what's next surprise. Okay, uh, why Hyperledger and, and Hyperledger Fabric? Uh, I think I kind of explained what Hyperledger is. I didn't just explain why Hyperledger. So the Linux Foundation, as I'm sure everybody in here knows, is you know, the leading foundation for any open source project. Why it's important to IBM specifically is that we're terrible at open source. I mean, just have a, a bad reputation and everything because we just have not built open source the way open source has been built or should be built in the past. I feel we're doing much better with this. Not great, much better. What I mean by that is normally we would develop something, toss it over the wall, say, look, it's open source. Cool, have at it, you know, knock yourself out. In this case, we're actually being held accountable by standards, um, which I am responsible for, along with Chris Ferris, who's the, one of the governing boards, who also is an IBMer, um, and with Blythe Masters, who's from, you know, the CEO of Digital Asset Holdings, 16 other members, large members of this organization, all come up together, bring proposals forward on what you have to do, what you have to accomplish, and they hold you to it. Trust me, they hold you to it. Oh. This guy over here, Nick, can attest to that. We're being beat senseless. So um, we're trying to uh, move. All right, let me, let me, I'm going down a rat hole here. All right, so why Hyperledger Fabric? So Fabric, we, we determined we don't want something that's proprietary. We want the base technology to be open source because it's the fastest way to grow anything. I mean, we've seen it over and over with many projects that we have just tossed over the wall to, to whoever wants to do it. It gets adopted, people start picking it up, and it really grows out to be, I mean, OpenStack, Cloud, Cloud Foundry, um, you know, countless numbers of things. And IBM's even seen, like, WebSphere, right? We've taken that, we've thrown it off. Symphony, we've taken that, given that to Apache. We've We've done countless numbers of things like that and it gets adopted and then we see it grows fast and it grows faster than we can grow because we're just this limited little pod of developers. Open source has always been very good, um, keeps everybody honest and then anybody has the ability to see what the heck is going on underneath and then figure out how they make money off of that by building something on top of it. That's what fabric is, and that's what the name of fabric is, right? It's the fabric of what you're going to build on. It starts out, you got your base level, the platform. Now you can build applications, build something that's supply chain. Supply chain is my favorite, by the way, um, which I was happy that Mita showed the coffee beans. There's coffee bean demo out there, by the way, just side comment. Um, so uh, what we're trying to accomplish, as I mentioned, permissioned membership, governance, all done through policies. Um, even the endorsements of transactions you're going through. You have to get through all these agreements, just like any other blockchain technology, right? You, you have to get agreement from the other participants. If you know them or you don't know them, 
but they have to agree that this is acceptable and it can be put onto your ledger, which will never change. Immutable ledger, oh, not on there. Um, performance, so we are working in a community to come up with performance tools because we want to have blockchain you know, the best performing blockchain that we can. For enterprise type of, of transactions, when you look at a stock exchange or any sort of trade settlement, it has to be quick. Otherwise, you're losing the, the value add of what we're trying to accomplish. I mean, imagine if you can sit down, get that stack of papers, or imagine what you're doing right now, right? You, you sit down, got that stack of papers for mortgages, you know, there, 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 you're starting to bleed, you're writing through all this stuff. Months later, you get the final, thing, final paperwork that says, hey, guess what, you got your house. If you could do that, sit down on a computer, actually type this in, where the tax, the state office, the attorney, the realtor, the person selling that house, so on and so forth, are already on this chain, and they can have the automated transaction go out, they approve it, comes back, gets sent, gets ordered on the ledger, you walk out, you have your paperwork. I'm done. You can do this kind of stuff. It's all settlement. I mean, that, that, that's what this is about. I mean, it's saving the middleman. It's saving and a lot of the painful mechanisms, the paperwork that Mita was talking about. There are people that actually get on a plane, fly paperwork from one country to another so that this guy can sign it. Let me fly back home. That's crazy. At least I think it's crazy. It was 70s, right? 1970. I was alive then. 1970s. Um, so... Uh, <laughs> So other, other value adds that we're, we're adding in. So a pluggable framework. We always believed it needed to be a pluggable framework. Our first version, mm, yeah, not so much, right? We said that we were trying to make a pluggable framework in the 0 .5, 0 .6 version. No, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't real good. It was, but it was painful if you wanted to do it. In the, the version 1.0 that we're working on right now, Alpha 3 about to come out at the end of this week, End of this week, uh, Alpha 3 will be available, which is a pluggable, it, 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 the pluggability. What do I mean by pluggability? I, most of you probably understand this. You have the database, you have consensus algorithms, um, you have policy stuff, you have your peers. Um, plug anything you want in. Right now, in 0 .5, 0 .6, we had PBFT, right? I, I think most people hopefully know about Byzantine fault tolerance, or maybe, maybe not. It's a consensus algorithm that would go through, you do all your trusted handshakes, basically come up with the sequenced order of transactions to be able to put on the order. In point one, we're gonna offer two types. Solo, which is just that. It's a solo ordering node. So you send in your transactions. First one that gets there, checks the key values, all that, puts it in the right, right sequence, sends it down, gets approved, puts on the ledger. We'll also have a Kafka Zookeeper implementation. Another open source project meeting another open source project. Pretty cool. We're working on a, a new implementation of PBFT, or SBFT actually, um, that hopefully will come out shortly after 1.0 finally becomes approved by the Linux Foundation to be a, what do we call it, a production release, I guess. Uh, hopefully it'll be sooner than later. Don't know, they have to sign off. It's not IBM's thing. Um, databases. So we had RocksDB in version 0.5.6. There's some Facebook patent infringement issues with that, so we removed RocksDB. We went to uh, Go Level DB. We looked at Bolt. We looked at Mongo. We looked at uh, yada yada yada. Not not me to yada yada yada. But uh, um, and we settled on Go Level DB as a base with the option to go with CouchDB. Reason we did that, LevelDB is quick, but it doesn't have very good support for rich queries. CouchDB does, but you have to actually uh, maintain a side database to be able to work with it, the state database and your world state database for it. So those are a couple of things that we are after. Uh, all right, surprise number three. Ah, we have a bunch of members. I think I mentioned this. So the Hyperledger project, uh, specifically Hyperledger Fabric, has a, a boatload of big enterprise businesses that are currently involved. Some of them are more involved with the actual contributions inside the fabric. You look at like London Stock Exchange, State Street, um, Digital Asset Holdings, um, Intellect EU, bunch of bunch of these others. Some of them are just sitting on top lurking to see how do I make money off of this? 
all great, you know, because what they're doing is they're driving requirements back into my primary focus, which again is not IBM, it's the community. So the more that I get to understand what people are actually trying to do, build personas around what they're trying to accomplish, the better requirements I get and the more, you know, robust that we can make things. Um, one of the com common things that I've getting lately is, where's your, where's your coin? You know, where's your token? Give us a cryptocurrency of some sort. We're pluggable. Do it. Please, somebody come on. Do it. I was trying to talk Jameson into it today. <laughs> He's not biting so far. <laughs> but why not? I mean, we, we had a UTXO implementation in 0.5.6. It really wouldn't be hard to put it in, in 1.0 if, if that's something that you really want. Uh, I mean, our biggest thing is right now, we don't have mining or anything like that. So it's strictly about the transfer of assets. You know, if, if that's a, a, a diamond, coffee, whatever, you know, physical paper that you just scan, put into a hash, send around, whatever, that's fine. So, um, okay, so I kind of went off of that chart, got a lot of people. And thank you, awesome. All right, so, <laughs> let me, <laughs> So let, let's, uh, I don't know how long we have or anything, but let's open up to questions, comments, concerns. I can put on multiple hats and meet a wears five, twice as many as I do, so. What is your last name? My last name is Parzignat. <laughs> Perfect, right? It's Smith in Poland. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's P as in Peter, A-R-Z-Y-G-N-A-T actually just how it sounds. And I bet you spelled out a lot. I, yeah, yeah, Mark for the last 45 plus years. Yeah. Mark P. Yes, sir. Um, so uh, what, I was, what I was wondering, that was just, you were introduced as Mark, but we never knew your last name. And that's quite all right. So I should uh, do this it, before we start questions. Is it possible that uh, a blockchain, a blockchain that's implemented by our banking system in America has the ability to eliminate held funds such that all, all funds will pretty much be considered uh, certified, like a, a guaranteed certified check. And here it is, and it has the appropriate hash backed whatever in, in some, some banking systems transit, and people go, oh, the funds are good. Yes. Transfer does it have the capability of doing that? that that's, and yeah. Do bank are banks okay with that, or are they going? Man, we can't sit on funds now. Hey, hey, great question. Great question. So the answer is: Is it there? Yes. Do I want my account to be on it now? No. Um, are banks into it? They're not sure. So yes, no, and I don't know. I think are the uh, answers I could give you because. The reason I say that is, you know, Hyperledger, we're, I mean, let's face it, we're only a couple years old at this point, right? And people are still trying to figure out how to use us, how to, how to really get involved, what to do with it. So stability, I mean, we, we've got pretty good. We have some, some ways to go. I'm not, I mean, I'm just, you know, open kimono. It's not perfect yet. Um, more people that come, better it'll be. Uh, would, can we actually transfer these assets around? Yeah, that's what blockchains are out, uh, all about, yes. Are banks all in on it? I'm actually very surprised at how much they are into it at this point. A lot of it's still feelers, but there are people that are actually running large POCs, and even IBM, IBM Global Finance, is running on blockchain right now. So, Some of the banks have even packed. Like Bank of America uh, uh, absolutely. Yes, yes. Uh, so yes, I, I and I'm shocked. I, I, I am actually very shocked at how fast that they have been adopting blockchain as a real disruptor. And I hate the buzzword disruptor. Oh, we disruptor. We are dealing with a consortium of banks. And you may want to talk close to his mic. Ooh. We are dealing with a consortium of banks right now that are trying to do bank-to-bank -bank settlement. On the, on the on the blockchain so it's you know a consortium of more than 60 banks and whatever's involved in between you know to clear those transactions and they're trying to do a POC on it I'm hoping to go into production soon this is great uh, presentation by the 
so I'm just trying to understand that what's the idea of business model? You mentioned it's open source, but is the idea of it's a cloud? We have, yeah, we so we, there are several different things we are doing at IBM on. Uh, so we have, you know, our platform offerings where we have blockchain as a service, right? And then on top of that, we are in the solutions business as well. So we are spawn, spinning up live networks, right? We have one on, around global. Um, uh, we have we have one on trade finance. We have one around uh, dispute resolution. We have uh, and we just announced an accelerator program. Where where we are bringing in startups and incubating them as part of uh, for, for blockchain. We also are, have design thinking sessions, doing POCs with customers, you know, just a con consultancy thing. So we actually have the, the full stack. So starting from actually building the fabric, which we are doing out, out in the open, we have blockchain as a service, solutions out on top, and then our consulting services on top of that. Basically licensing and support we have we do we do ha we sell support so you can buy support if you want to but uh, we are building solutions so you know you can join so you know a food safety solution for with Walmart for example is something that we're doing um, you can you know so that's one model so we have different solutions we're looking at we are looking at one version of an identity solution with secure key in Canada uh, with a consortium of multiple banks then we have a consulting arm right where we just do consult on Hyperledger, right? And we have, we do garage design thinking sessions. So when we get a lot of questions from our banks and their partners together, what should we do, right? So we, we bring them in for a design thinking session and we take them through the, you know, the traditional design thinking exercise to help them figure out what they want to do and then, um, you know, leading, leading it into POCs. We, I said earlier, we also announced the founder accelerator program where we are taking in startups and actually incubating them. Yeah, a lot, a lot, when they start using the fabric and they start building on top of it, obviously, whether you consultants do it or not, do they open source what they do or do they consider that their own intellectual property? It varies. It? it varies, yeah. We've had some that have open sourced it. So there was a company that was work, work, writing legal framework around right. writing smart contracts. That's where they started, but then they open sourced it well, because they wanted to work with us on Apple Ledger. I've worked with a lot of banks yeah. in, in money laundering stuff. And I know they're very protective. Yeah, yeah. We've seen, you know, p people participating in open source from several different aspects. Yeah, yeah. One of the weaknesses of innovation is overlooking something that you are not overlooking, which is governance and the concept of permission membership. Could you expand a little bit on the work that's being done in that regard? Because I think that if you can put that course with the cart, yeah, yeah. you will rapidly improve the rate of adoption God help us if the lawyers get there first. Yeah. So with governance, um, we have some of the brightest hires that we ever did who have their P we have some of the brightest hires we ever d made, you know, uh, who have their PhDs working on the governance tool tooling for us. The way we look at governance is when you're defining a business network, right? So for example, um, the governance of Bitcoin is through mining. Right, you, this one, that's one way of looking at it. How do you do? How do you govern a permissioned network? So the way we are saying, nobody owns the blockchain, right? If you're bringing in five members to your network or ten members to your network, we are creating a system, a tool set where you find the governance of that particular network. So you can say, okay, just to give you an example, five members in that network, these three or everyone has to vote before anyone else can be added or kicked out. Right, you just can't, and we we take that to several different levels. So we have uh, separate channels of communications as well. So if there are ten banks in a network and two just wanted to communicate on a channel, they can, and that entire governance piece also lives in that particular channel as well. So then you can say, okay, on that channel, uh, we are the two members. No one else can be added or removed without both of us voting. So we have variations thereof. So we're building this entire toolkit, and we've made it super easy from our blockchain as a service because. What well, we found in the industry that this governance piece is missing, right? It's, 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 it's not there. I think companies are looking at it now, so they're going to catch up. We've been working on governance. I've been working on governance since October, September of last year. That's when we really started focusing on it. So this, the, we are going to GA soon, and when we GA the IBM blockchain as a service, it will come with a, a big piece of governance. As a point of information, uh, when electronic data interchange was introduced in the 1980s, uh, it took 17 years 
at the UN to put in place the governance model that would allow the digital record to be accepted as the evidence of the transaction. But the model law that came out of that effort was the first law adopted at faster than any other law Ever. in the history of humankind. Over 150 nations within 10 years adopted that as a rule of law. Yeah. So the exciting thing here, as you develop governance, is to think about connecting the autonomy of a blockchain distributed ledger system to the institutional status of the nation state so that you can also leverage that governance in there. Yeah. That's actually pretty cool. Welcome offline chat with you. Yeah. Yeah. I happen to be the, one of the guys that led that UN effort. Oh, really? Oh, uh, that's exciting. <laughs> you might be very interested to actually go out to YouTube and look at, look up um, uh, Jerry Como and talking to con Congress. He actually has been up there several times on C-SPAN, which are recorded, about talking exactly about this. How does it affect us? How does ident identity, you know, and any governance affect the government and what we're into? Right. So it, it, it's actually very interesting. It's long, yeah. but it's interesting. Yeah, I was very flattered uh, last year when there was testimony at Congress on Bitcoin. And my testimony in 1994 on the future of money was cited as a predicate <laughs> nice. for Bitcoin. Nice. So, Congrats. Congratulations. That's awesome. Thank you. And I still will tell you that the governance piece will be where you will really? make or break the momentum. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And You're right. I hear you putting that level of effort in. Yeah, yeah. 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 Does, uh, does that tie into backwards compatibility? issues, like if you're planning on making breaking changes to your software, uh, is there any sort of like service level agreement that you're, you're planning on offering uh, regarding backwards compatibility or would it really come down to the governance? That's my number one requirement okay. is that once one OGAs is we always have to be backwards, backwards compatible. compatible. Always. But what do you mean by backwards compatibility? Are you mean, do you mean you can ha hard fork the code and yeah, do something like else with it? Yeah, that would yeah protocol break changes that. that would require you to upgrade, yeah. otherwise you're no longer really participating in mm. the same network. Yeah. Yeah. He, he's been holding his hand up for a while. You mentioned uh, you're kind of working in the enterprise world, also the open source software world. I guess I have two questions. How do you filter down feedback into deliverables, and how does that work into what IBM is Okay, good. Uh, good question. So, um, first and foremost, events like this. Is it? Oh, so uh, question one was how do I filter down requirements from the community? Uh, let me answer that one first. So, first and foremost, events like this, where I, I like to go out, talk, um, gather requirements, interests, and things. We also have a open source. Uh, channel which is called rocket chat it's very similar to, to slack uh, we have channels along the fabric everywhere so if you have any requirements questions concerns comments vents um, you can put them out there um, a majority of the IBM team is on there um, all of the hyperledger community is on those channels and so we always are watching uh, third is Jira we live and die in Jira. We have uh, just opened up uh, 4,438 before I walked out the door today of uh, items to be done. Doesn't mean that we have that many open currently, but uh, that's the current number we're at. So just in you know a year, we've had you know 4,400 different issues, bugs, requirements, um, enhancements, all that stuff put in. Uh, and then your second question was, I'm sorry. Basically, how does that influence IBM's vision of what hyperledger will be as yeah, uh, another uh, awesome question. So this has been actually a very interesting debate amongst our uh, high-level executives because uh, it's it's a I don't want to say 50-50 split, but there is a split somewhere that some of the executives are fabric is it right? We're, we're putting our eggs in, in fabric we have for the last two years, and the others are like, no. Fabric is not necessarily it. It's the prodding of blockchain technology. If there is a better technology out there that is more widely adapted, uh, adopted and standardized, that is the technology to do it. At the end of the day, we want to make solutions on top of it, like, like me to discuss. We want to be uh, cloud hosting providers for blockchain technologies as well. So um, it, it's kind of a split among the walls. 
personally, I love um, the Hyperledger Fabric Code. That's where I, I spend all my time, so I'm a little more biased. You can kind of see which side I fall on, but you know, I could easily be overruled and my paycheck goes where I'm overruled to. So. There's nothing else in the market that has the permissionness and the governance that piece that we talked about that we've built into the fabric. And you know, just to add to Mark's answer, you know, of course if you're contributing to the fabric and you, or if you have requirements, you can go open an issue in Jira. What we are also doing from a data perspective is every digital touch point, that, every touch point we, ha we have with a customer, even in open source, Source, right? We uh, ask, we, we want to be rated. So we're starting this effort where we want you to rate us, you know, a net promoter score. From a, on a score of zero to 10, how would you recommend? How like, likely are you to recommend us to someone else? Then we take those comments and they actually go into our product design cycle, even if it's for open source. We take that feedback from customers, which is just a random, might, might be just a random comment somebody put in on an angry day, but we take it seriously. We take that feedback, we analyze all our comments, we run them through a sentiment analysis, we take them in, and then it goes back into our product design cycle. We do user, re user research around it, and that's how it helps us define hyperledger more. The way Hyperledger has, you know, the way we've uh, come around is our enterprise clients, you know, the open source community, what we were doing, they, they had certain requirements, they had certain expectations, right? And we had certain thoughts on what we wanted to build. So it all came together and, it, you know, Hyperledger was formed. And it's changed, you know, point one, 1.0 is very different from point 0.6. So we, we pivot, make changes, make, you know, take in as we move and take recommendations in. Yeah. What are you, what are you guys doing with the analytics? The uh, oh, so. <clears throat> one of your vice presidents had a keynote there, and he mentioned lots of. So we have, we actually just kicked off officially, you know, analyt you mean analytics on the blockchain, right? Yes, we have, yeah. Yeah, we have a team that's leading that effort. So, you know, we um, we are working with Everledger on uh, tracking diamonds. We, so we're running analytics for them on just the, just the diamond tracking, but we're, you know, creating um, connectors so that it's easy to analyze that data. And we just, you know, it's Watson and other tool sets as well. So we want to make it easy for somebody who's using the blockchain to be able to get their data so that they can analy analyze it, so have plugins for different tools and just make it super easy Even to do it. It's beautiful, it's <coughs> after it's entered, it's still moving very fast. Yeah, and yeah. Moving, it's, there's always a two-pronged piece to it, seems to me. There's a static piece, which is an immutable piece, but the stuff like the streaming side of it where you keep in track of the blockchain being updated. Yeah. So we have, if you try IBM Blockchain as a service, we just have very few analytics which just, you know, tracks the block size, transactions, transaction rate, you know, just as something very basic that you can look at, but we're looking at doing just more deeper analytics on the flow of the traffic as well as the content yeah. of the data as well. There's a pretty cool demo, again, YouTube. We put a lot on YouTube, just so yeah. everybody knows, but if you do a uh, search for Donna Dillenberg, so you'll see she actually gives, I think it's probably Don, D Donna Dillenberg. And you'll see she's given a demo on analytics and some of the things that we we're able yeah, to do on there. There wasn't a lot of that in consensus. You know, a lot of, most of it was blockchain functionality. Yeah. yeah. She's yeah. actually leading the effort now to yeah. bring in an analytics into that. She's an IBM fellow. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, let me go back to, he was. Um, right. Could you, a couple of questions. Could you first explain what the difference is between uh, Hyperledger and an existing uh, blockchain application, other existing blockchain application <coughs> platforms like uh, Ethereum in particular. And what projects are IBM uh, developing uh, right now in-house and possibly for other clients we can talk about that, uh, that actually use uh, blockchain? Few examples of what's actually built or what is close or what is fairly close to completion. Yeah, so uh, first question. Yeah, good. So, first question What are some of the key differences between uh, the Hyperledger Fabric Code and some of the other uh, blockchain technologies out there? Uh, as Mita has mentioned, you know, the governance model is, is one of the biggest pieces. The pluggability nature of the fabric code, being able to, to you know bring your own databases, whatever, um, and also the uh, um, 
That was the other thing I was thinking about. Uh, bring your own code is one of the biggest things. Using the Docker container technology, you don't have to learn a specialized language in order to develop uh, code against our blockchain technology. So those are some of the top key pieces. Examples of uh, different solutions that people are using. Um, it's actually pretty pretty easy. You can go out there and, and, and Google the, uh, the IBM blockchain, Hyperledger Fabric, or Hyperledger code bases, and you'll see companies like uh, Maersk, SecureKey, Everledger, um, Walmart, uh, IBM themselves, we're eating our own dog food. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, we, we have a bunch of different companies that we have developed solutions for or are assisting to develop solutions. And we have something that's called the IBM Blockchain Garage and labs, lab engagements that will, you can set up a services contract, basically walk in the door and set up a, a, a week's worth of, of work with our team and walk away with something you know so it's pretty pretty cool we as a matter of fact uh nick gasky over here who i haven't introduced is uh, a fellow ibmer and, and friend of ours and he was a mentor at a hackathon at hyperledger just before consensus the weekend before consensus where people could come in with a business thought hey would this work on blockchain and he worked to actually create solutions for several different startups um, on the Hyperledger Fabric code. And there was a contest at the end, you know, so people walked away with some pretty cool prizes and then uh, moved into the consensus um, showcase the, that following week. So there's a lot, of, a lot of different avenues and a lot of different people that are, are using it right now. If you go to ibm.com slash blockchain, we have a lot of uh, projects that people found there. Thank you. Sir. Uh, the analytics. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I need it. <laughs> no, no, no it's, it's the analytics actually made me made me remember uh, another one of my questions, which was during your part of the presentation, Mark, which was uh, query. So, what what query language? What query facility? What 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 would be your query? Is it Sparkle or or something? You, you can use so SQL. So. So I need to, can I hear you? Um, what kind of query searches? So it, it's any normal database query searches. You can use for, for uh, CouchDB, you can use SQL-like query searches for being able to do range queries, stuff like that. It's not completely implemented, so it's not just a free-for-all. There are some limitations, but we're, we're working through that as much as we can. Okay, uh, and then my last question was uh, the impact on the possible impact on voting so people you know is it possible that we could finally put to rest this this straw man of voter fraud and voter what whatever uh you know is it possible that you could get um you know electronic voting as opposed to to in, in person in, in person voting you know, is there some way that blockchain yeah. could, revolu could revolutionize that particular paper system right. and still maintain the anonymity of any given voter's vote? Yeah, so can blockchain actually be functionality, have functionality in the voting system? Well, I don't want to rush in into any answers. Oh, no, 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 sorry, I didn't go there. No. <laughs> um, yes, I, I, as a matter of fact, there was uh, somebody in our lab playing before the, the elections came out, actually playing with blockchain technology and a voting mechanism. All comes down to identity. As you said, maintaining, exactly, um, maintaining that absolutely is essential. So uh, there is so much work being done in identity right now, and it goes back to the gentleman's question back there earlier. Once identity is 100% resolved, what can't we do? Yeah. I mean, honestly. In so, SecureKey, the people are using their bank authentication to get to their tax records. Right. And you know, SecureKey uses this, use, this case where this girl, um, actually went to a bar to get a drink and she showed her driver's license to the bartender and he followed her home and it didn't go pretty well it didn't go well so they're saying can you have 
you know, a way of just sharing what you can just selectively, he, he just needed to know her age, nothing else, right? So that's, that's the idea. It's going there. There are a lot of startups we are seeing in the space of identity, know your customer, AML. So I think, I think we'll get there. It's just a matter of time. And it's more than just startups. It's yeah, all it's, of yeah. the verification companies that yeah. you can think of, all the major heads yeah. are currently actively involved in Blockchain is a team sport. At the end of the day, you're going to hear this a lot. Blockchain is a team sport. And being able to control who on your team provides what information is, is key. We can do some of that already. I don't know if it's bulletproof. I can't say yay or nay. I, I'll just stand by it. You know, all the wrinkles aren't out of anything at this point. You build software, they build somebody that can break it, right? But we are really working hard as a community, not IBM, as a community to come up with solutions of identity. There's an identity working group all the time that meets weekly through the Hyperledger um, project. All the projects are on it. It's very important and it's the key to everything. I think we're very close with some of the things that we're doing with Project Indy of, of having a, a, a real almost bulletproof solution there. Yeah, go ahead. Um, with what you just brought up, it's kind of skewed what I wanted to ask and talk about. But what you're mentioning is the X road. And so with Guard Time's participation within Fabric, how deep is Guard Time's participation with Fabric? And what the Guard Time's done with the X road already in Estonia over the last 15 years? You got me. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Him. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. I don't know. Him. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, I'm not up yeah. to speed on that. Yeah, so much more. But I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, I just, yeah, with, well. with you mentioned that, are you familiar with X road? No, I'm not. No. Um, no. I, it would, I, I, I have to go out there and look, yeah. It would behoove, behoove all of us in the blockchain space to become familiar with what Estonia crafted and what China, yeah, and what China has done, yeah. copy it, and what other Perfect. people have done. And they've, yeah. they, uh, they did a good job. Yeah. And so I, 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 I've, uh, looked at, I've looked at Estonia, yeah, okay. No, okay, no, that's fine, that's fine. Yeah. I actually want to kind of go back to your question about the identity stuff, too. I don't want to give a false impression that we have no, no con, you know, that we can, that we have no way to hide some of the transactions and flows to see kind of patterns and stuff. We already have that, you know, through T-cert implementation and things of that nature. It provides that linkable, unlinkable nature to be able to get back to individuals and stuff like that. We have, you know, false transactions and stuff to hide tracks and different concepts like that. So it's not just completely if you're in, you're in, you know everything that's going on from everybody. That's not the case at all. So. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, that the fellow in the black there has been. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of people would find a contradiction in terms of the information in blockchain. Uh, a lot of people would say, how do you separate the phrase blockchain from the phrase in your database? And the most important way of separating that is blockchain is permissionless. <coughs> but you guys seem to be kind of pushing the, this permission uh, database, but still wanting to the word blockchain. So blockchain is a DSL, right? It's a, it's a DSL, distributed ledger technology. So permissionless or, uh, permissioned or permissionless. I mean, I, 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 I personally don't see them, um, you know. Blockchain is just a data structure. Yeah, yeah. You can yeah. then manage the data structure in a number of different ways. Yeah. Yeah. Unpermission, yeah. And all of our enterprise clients, they don't want to go anywhere near unpermission stuff, you know. Yeah. No, it, it's a val it's a, absolutely a valid question. Can you can you make it can you take a permission system and make a permissionless system out of it? Absolutely. You know, you could take hyperledger and say, okay, take the permissions out. Yeah. No, it, it's a it's a great question and, and yeah, I mean the the, the thought and patterns behind it, because I mean you're basically creating a, just a, a normal network, right? With just letting, you know, having that governance model around it. But it's got the same concepts once you lift that governance model off of really any other blockchain technology, sharing it, getting rid of the middleman, you know, trying to accomplish the same sorts of things. Yeah, it has those features. So, you know, people have said, you shouldn't call it blockchain. And I was like, okay, we'll call it Apple or tomatoes. Oh, wait, 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 wait. No, I don't think we can do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anything else. Like, I mean, you, it, it does, it has some of those key features that blockchain technology has that we needed. We've just brought in permissioning on top of it because that's what, you know, most of our use cases need a permission system. They don't want people anonymously jo joining and participating in the network. So, yeah. Did you have a question? Uh, 
Uh, what's your streaming rate? What's, what streaming data can you run through your chain systems at this point? Oh, we are running performance numbers right now. Yeah. That you can do like VOIP and... It, it depends on who you talk to. So, yes. Some are saying over 10,000 transactions a second. But then, you know, others are saying, well, we got that one going through. So, you know. No, no, but, but, but I'm, I'm not trying to cop out of your question. No. We are honestly running performance yeah. in the lab right now as we speak. And there will be so numbers that are produced. We will publish we those numbers, yeah. We've so. been focused on that for three years, just yeah. trying to yeah. pass all data through blockchains. And the smart man back there was yeah. right to say, well, what is that? And we, yeah. we took the same assumption you all did when I talked with Brody two and a half years ago and I said we want to pass all data through blockchain he says you're absolutely on to it and you guys seem to be leading the way we're a five person startup in your IBM so well you know one thing job. I, I mentioned earlier and, I, and I, it would be awesome actually if you would join the performance benchmarking tool work group that we have in Hyper. we're trying to figure out what do you really measure you know I mean all right just the lossless way yeah, but I mean, yeah, there's so many different things. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, there's so many different things. I mean, what are you actually trying to do? What are the number of agreements that you have to have in place based on policies and things? So we're trying to come up with use cases and tooling that would go across multiple blockchain technologies just so that we can just do some, yeah, some benchmarks. So much. Like in the enterprise space, I'm, I'm sorry, Jameson's listened to me for a year of waste <laughs> time with him. Unless when, you, when you release this into an enterprise system of established trust, and when you have a fast processing, it opens up a whole new way of just doing simple business operations. And yeah. I talked, talked to Paul last week, and he's like, yeah, I retool all of EY to do biz ops chain. I'm like, well, great, Paul, you got 225,000 votes. Yeah. But y'all, I, I just appreciate you leading the way, talking to VCs and, and uh, uh, angel investors. They don't, first of all, understand blockchain. Most of them don't, and they certainly don't understand enterprise applications of blockchain yeah. when they only know Bitcoin. But, yeah, I, yeah. I can reference your work, actually, and Paul's work and say, this is what they're talking about. And it still is lost on them. So I'd love to do anything <laughs> with y'all. Yeah. Anything. Yeah. That'd be great. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, 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 is there a follow-up to that? Uh, you better. Yeah. <laughs> so is that a, a kind of benchmark number in terms of, when you talk about a network of the uh, blockchain, right, in the sort of given solution, it's like redundant data, right? So like every transaction is updating to all the possible nodes, right? And, and as the nodes increase, you're talking about like you know, thousands of transactions, every transaction is going to like talk about the nodes, right? Is there a bottleneck on that? Like, you know, beyond certain nodes can do, beyond certain transactions it can't perform, right? So I'm wondering, you know, how, how do you solve the problem? There's uh, a big tech question. So, so he's talking about it as, as a network. As a network scales and you have, you know, tens of thousands of peers and running hundreds of thousands of transactions you did simultaneously, whatever, concurrently or close to, how do you actually deal with that performance and what is actually being looked at to be, be able to deal with that performance? Um, there's actually several different things that we're talking about and, and part of it, and it escaped, I'm sitting here trying to, date, uh, what is it, data? not parsing, but data sharding. We're looking at different different methods of, of data sharding to, to potentially help with that. Um, we're looking at, actually, if you set up a, po uh, a, a certain policy and say, you know, out of this group, I need to have 15 of you actually endorse a particular transaction, but everybody's getting the copy. Maybe I don't define those particular 15. I just kind of you know, spread it out to 15 of you, random, 15 of you, random, whatever, and do it that way. There's a lot of different methods that we can do to actually scale that that ability. And it, it will take, oh, I'm on, on the camera, I won't say the word I was going to say. It will take a heck of a lot of uh, uh, transactions to actually be able to, to break us. Um, Is there any big data technologies in the Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that, that's the IBM side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, our big data group um, is also involved, of course, and and some, I mean some of it comes just down to uh, hardware performance, which you know she knows better than, than me by far. But you you look at uh, some of the boxes that IBM has in house, and they're pretty pretty incredible. Mm. Yes. So you, you used the example earlier uh, with real estate to purchase house and, and uh, how, how it could be streamlined. Mm -hmm. 
I'm just wondering if, in, in your opinion, in the next five years, where is the best application where it might actually be uploaded and used? Where, where might it make a transformative effect? Uh, blockchain itself? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's already there for supply chain. I mean, in my, my heart of heart, there is no better use case for any blockchain technology over supply chain. I mean, that's just, that's just money. <laughs> Literally <laughs> and figuratively. <laughs> where, where, where else? Just, <laughs> just, at, just as Mita showed with the coffee bean demo, you do a, 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 a farm the fork type of, of scenario, tracking all of that stuff. I mean, we're, we're talking about flying. You, you don't have to fly this paper anywhere. You sign it there. You, you, you do all the transactions on blockchain automatically. You set up the business logic in your, your smart contracts, chain code, whatever you want to call it, to do it right then and there, and it's done. I mean, if you think about a, a, a very, I mean, one of, the, one of my favorite use cases is railroad company. So there's a big or, orange, orange juice manufacturer in Florida that has to ship orange juice containers from Florida to New York. Sounds pretty easy, but when you really look into it, between Florida and New York, there's 13 independent privately owned railroad companies. If you take blockchain technology, not just for I'm transferring from this private railroad to this private railroad, but you put an IoT device on there to measure the temperature of that orange juice to see if it gets over the spoiling factor, you add that in there. So immediately you can say, I'm sorry, you know, you screwed up, it, it's spoiled, I don't want it. Then you take an IoT device that actually measures, and this is really cool, I, I just, I really like this. They, they actually listen to the sound of the drums on the rails, right? So that the actual turning of the rail cars on there. And they have scientifically proven that if there one certain frequency hits three times in a quarter mile, that car will derail, period. End of story, it will derail. So they can take that, put it on blockchain tech now, because if I'm, if I'm um, you know, railroad company one, and I hear that sound twice, but I haven't hit that half mile before I turn it over to you. You hear it for the first time. Oh, well guess what? It already happened twice, but I didn't give you that information. Bang, railed, derailed. So if you have that constantly updating, another cool you know, piece of that one use case, along with just that transfer of the asset all the way down, then, if you screw up and it's late, I can penalize you 10% of the profits because guess what? It was your mistake. You didn't, you didn't make the, the tracks right to, to get it through in time. And there's so many cool different factors that you can actually add in here, all being put automatically on an immutable ledger that can never change. It's just pretty darn cool in my opinion. And Thank so you. Mark is uh, passionate about supply chain. I'm passionate about identity. I think identity is going to be the one, you know, that's going to be transformative for everyone. I think prominence is really important to me. Come on up, Nate. No, I just, All right, we have a third use case. Let me, to, we'll, we'll go through the identity. And <laughs> well, so they've, they've touched on these use cases, but Provenance to me makes a lot of sense for a litany of reasons. So Mita talked about food safety with pork, right? So if we have a E. coli outbreak or something with spinach or pork, you can isolate exactly where that contaminated um, shipment went or an auto recall or, you know, diamonds, wine, doing stuff with forgeries you kind of can go across the entire spectrum and realize that if I say that this, this thing is what it is and it still is what it is, we can track it back to the, the place of origin. So I'm a, I'm a fan of oh. provenance, definitely. That's second on the list. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Thank no, you. Now you gotta stand up for the rest of time too. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, this is uh, Nick. He's uh, our, our developer, tester, uh, ID writer, and presenter, yeah. all wrapped up in one Stripe yeah. bundle. And I think he gets less sleep on the entire team. And that's, uh, that's, a, <laughs> that's tough. It's tough to do that. <laughs> but I think he gets the least amount of sleep. Probably not true. Any other questions? Or? No, I, well, I, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up. Yeah. Uh, you can definitely chat after. We'll, we'll finish up the official part here. But uh, definitely. Thank you. Thank you.